before I talk to you about God this morning, I'd actually like to talk to God about you. And so if you would, uh, just take a moment and let's bow our heads. Not because it makes the moment more sacred, it just makes the moment less distracting. And, and those of you who are joining us online, uh, even where you are, um, you don't have to watch me on the screen right now. I want you to hear these words kind of wash over you. Um, good morning, Father. A lot of us are weary, and not just from the things that we have had to do. Some of us are tired right now from the things that we're not able to do. We feel a little bit like a child who is being told that they're not allowed to do some things, and honestly, we don't like how it feels, but then again, no child really does. It's hard for us to trust that you are in control when we are being told no. So would you help us today, instead of hearing no, to hear not yet? Would you replace our frustration with what we cannot do right now to a hopeful expectation of when we will be able to do those things? Help us imagine the day we will hear yes and help us to be prepared for that day when it comes so we don't miss those opportunities. And help us find different ways to do the things that we can do now, not, not in begrudging ways, but in creative and fun ways. In fact, share creative ideas with us. We're so grateful for your peace. We're so grateful for your joy, and we're grateful that they are not limited by our circumstances. So we gladly receive a fresh supply of those things today. In Jesus' name. And everyone who agreed with that prayer said, Amen. We're in a series called Being the Church. And what we've discovered is you might get bored with going to church. You will never get bored with being the church. And we're in Acts. Um, we've been taking about a chapter a week. And there were two stories in Acts chapter 8. I just couldn't leave one of them out. And so we're going back to Acts chapter 8 today. We'll go to chapter 9 next week. But uh, Acts chapter 8, we're beginning in verse 9, and it says, "For Now for some time a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria, and he boasted that he was someone great. And all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, this man is rightly called the great power of God. Does anybody get a sense that his capacity to boast and, and get out his message would have worked in our culture probably just as well? They followed him because he amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. But when they believed, Philip, as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. And Simon himself believed and was baptized and followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria, and when they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. And Peter answered, May your money perish with you, because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part 
or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Then Simon answered, Pray to the Lord for me, so that nothing you have said may happen to me. And after they had further proclaimed the word of the Lord and testified about Jesus, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. There is more to our world than what is visible or material. There is more to our world than what is visible or material. It sounds like an anti-scientific statement. And uh, as I understand, I'm not a scientist and I don't have a science mind. Uh, my wife is more the science-minded person in our family. But as I understand it, science is kind of like a systematic study of the structure and behavior of the physical and natural world so that we can understand how things work. And what I will tell you is, is that science is no enemy to true spirituality, to the church, or to the gospel. The challenge is not trying to understand our world. We should want to do those things. But there are some things that are not observable the same way that other things are. And so it is one thing for a scientist or a science-minded person to say, you know, um, these things I think we've got a good handle on. That's something I have no capacity to be able to to observe or to make a determination about, and so I have, I just don't know about that. That's one position. But it's another position to say, if I can't observe it, then it doesn't exist. And by the way, you don't have to be a, a science-minded person to say that. There are lots of people in our culture who, if they can't see it, if they can't touch it and feel it, if they can't hold it or control it, it's not real to them. And so we are surrounded with things that are visible, but Scripture pulls back a veil and tells us that we're also surrounded by things that are not visible. Christianity recognizes that there are problems that can be physical in nature and problems that can be spiritual in nature. Sometimes it's either or, sometimes it's both and. And Christianity actually offers responses to all of those options instead of just some. Because there are some people in spirituality, it's all spiritual. There's no physical. There are people on the physical side of things, materials. It's all material. There's nothing more than that. And so Christianity helps us respond to both. The reason why this is important is if we don't have a response to both, then we'll have a limitation in our understanding of what actually causes things to work, and we will have limited options in terms of how we respond to what's happening in our world. So we are influenced by what we see, and we are influenced by what we do not see. Well, you might not believe this, so let me give a couple examples of things that are not necessarily visible, but uh, they, they are real, and I think we recognize it. Uh, for example, prejudice. How many know there's been a little bit of conversation about that in our culture recently? Prejudice. And a materialist will say, prejudice is a learned behavior, and you learn it by observing the family that you're raised in and the people you hang out with, and then you repeat that behavior. And don't get me wrong, we start observing before we are capable of uttering words. We're paying attention. And we pay attention to how people talk to each other, and we pay attention to how people talk about other people when those people aren't around. We pay attention when someone makes fun of or suspects something less of someone else and how other people join in that conversation. We pay attention to all of that. And it would be so easy to say, that's the source of all of our prejudice in our culture. But, so here's what I want you to know. First of all, that doesn't explain for where this starts. Where did people learn to do this? Help me understand why we can make a negative assumption about someone based on the pigment of the skin or the accent they have when they talk. Where did we get the idea, if you look different, you are less? 
And by the way, this doesn't have to be an ethnicity thing. We talk differently to people who weigh more than we do than we talk to people who weigh less than we do. We talk differently to people based on their height, on their education, on their financial prowess, all of these things. We interact very differently. We make assumptions about people all the time. Where does that come from? Why do we treat people so differently based on the assumptions that we make? Another example. This one's easier to take. Okay. Thought I would start hard and go easy, and, and then when you go out of here today, you'll, you won't remember the hard part. Potential. Potential's not visible. And yet, we claim that we know people have potential. And we encourage them to live up to their potential. And we get frustrated when they don't. Right? Can you see their potential? No. But you believe that it's real. You believe it's so real, you are willing either to sacrifice or confront something in the present moment where you can't see anything because you believe something you can't see is that real. Scripture teaches us that there is another invisible force. It's embedded into our soul. It's, it's connected with us even before we take our first breath, and that invisible force is sin. And so we don't have to learn to observe how to either compare ourselves with someone else in a way that makes us feel better or compete with someone that we think actually is better. That is embedded into our heart from before we utter our first word or take our first breath. It's sin. It's invisible. It affects our world. And here's the challenge. Our world right now, like say on prejudicial issues, it's just saying that if we could just get people to stop saying things, I can tell you something. That's not the same as becoming unprejudicial. That's just hiding your prejudice. And this is what I know. I've been in ministry for a while. And everything people hide gets worse under the ground. And when it comes back up, it comes up with a vengeance. Our world is dealing with things based on what we observe only. And it's a problem. Now, I think every people group, I've, I'm not a, a sociologist either, but as I understand it, nearly every people group that's ever been around in history acknowledges some spiritual reality, often in a superstitious way. Superstitious just means that you approach it with a kind of fear. Okay? So some superstitions are kind of harmless. Uh, I won't ask if you or your kids do this, but we're going to be coming into a season pretty soon where when kids who don't want to go to school and they think that there's a possibility of a snow day, they will do something like sleep with their pajamas inside out. Why? Because there's a part of them that hopes that inside out pajamas will, will close the school, right? And so that's just kind of cute and funny. But I can tell you that some superstitions aren't just harmless or cute. Some superstitions actually paralyze people to the point that they're unable to function or go forward in something because they're certain that some force is working against them. So this is, this is the realm of Simon. He's a sorcerer. Now, as soon as I say that, this is where the modern mind just really struggles and they go, yeah, <laughs> see, that's what I don't, you people actually believe that stuff. He's, he's just doing magic tricks. It's, it's sleight of hand. That, that's all there is. So says the materialist. Because there can't be anything you can't see. So I'm not going to ask you to accept this on an emotional level, I'm going to ask you to consider this on an intellectual level. Are you really willing to state or hold to the idea that the only things that exist are the things that you can see? 
and that the only kind of spiritual force that exists in our world is just a pretend thing where it's a sleight of hand, a magic trick. And that somehow Simon did some, maybe he did some sleight of hand stuff too, but he made a living and had quite a reputation. He built a reputation and he made a lot of money on the idea that he could change your future by tapping in to his spiritual powers. People would come to him and they, this is what they would want. They would want to be able to live life without pain. I mean, don't we all? And they would want their enemies to be undercut. And they would want to have opportunities that maybe they hadn't earned and didn't deserve, but they wanted them anyway. And so this guy had a reputation for being able to tap into some kind of invisible force that would kind of reduce or eliminate pain in your life and, and kind of undercut the enemies, like maybe they would get sick or die and, 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 and provide opportunity for you. And he made a lot of money. He was considered the most high power in that region. And, and who doesn't want that, right? See, this is the challenge. People approach Christianity and people approach the Holy Spirit as though it's the same as magic. It's just approved magic. That the whole goal of Christianity is just to eliminate pain in our life. If you think that, you're going to get disappointed with Christianity pretty fast. It didn't eliminate pain in Jesus' life. When they were pounding nails, he wasn't go, doesn't even hurt. Well, my life would just be better without pain, Pastor. No, it wouldn't. And I can prove it. If our body was incapable of experiencing pain, we would actually accelerate its destruction. You would touch something hot and not even pull back, and your skin would burn, and you wouldn't even notice. If, if you are unable to walk or get out of bed on your own, one of the things that people will do who care for you is they will come in and they will keep adjusting your body position every so often because your body breaks it down and you develop ulcers. Um, the, the disease of leprosy is not a rotting of the human flesh. The disease of leprosy is a numbing of the human flesh. And when your skin is numb, then things happen that begin to break it down. And here's what I will tell you. The natural tendency of the human heart is to want a pain-free life. And that's the very thing that will accelerate our destruction in our world. Things break down faster when we don't have any pain. Well, I don't want my heart broken, Pastor. I've only got one solution for that, and that is to have the hardest heart possible. Is that really the life you want? Well, this is what sorcery does. Undercut your enemies. I mean, those people are bad. They're trying to hurt me, or at least limit me, and they shouldn't be allowed to do that. Okay? So they should get sick. They should die. And what makes a person an enemy? Someone who says a negative thing to you or about you. you know, Jesus did not say, when you get spiritual enough, you can pray a prayer and your enemies will be destroyed before you. Jesus said this, love your enemies. Why would he say that? Because there is a huge difference between the Holy Spirit and magic. Well, I want opportunities, okay? Do you want opportunities that flow out of wisely stewarding the resources that you have, the, 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 the chances that are before you, or do you actually want them to be taken from someone else because you want them? And Simon was a person who established in his community, I can tap into an invisible force that makes those things happen for you. Interestingly enough, Simon believed in the word that was preached by Philip, 
And he was baptized in water. And I know lots of people say, but he wasn't really a believer. We don't know that. We do know something was missing. And the missing point was repentance. So Peter came from Jerusalem, and he comes from Jerusalem uh, for, for, well, basically they ask him to come and to lay hands on people so that they can receive the Holy Spirit. And the, the question is, is this kind of, the apostles had a monopoly. The only people who can receive the Holy Spirit is when the apostles lay hands on you. And the answer is no, that, that's not why he was there. He was there basically to do two things. One is to validate that what was happening in this city was an authentic expression of faith. And he was a person qualified to make that assessment. But to do something else, when he laid hands on people, it wasn't just a magic way to transfer something of the Spirit to another person. They had laid hands on people uh, when, they, when they ordained them into ministry to serve and wait on tables. They, they were constantly laying hands on people. It was a way of saying, we are part of each other. We belong to you and you belong to us. It was, it was a way to demonstrate community, connection, support, mutual support. And you have to realize, these same apostles were in the group that just a few years before that, when they were walking with, through G, with Jesus through a village and they got rejected, they came up with a brilliant idea. James and John, they went to Jesus and this is what they said. Let's call fire down out of heaven and let's torch this village for rejecting us. Hallelujah. <laughs> And, and Jesus said, you don't even know what spirit you are of. You do not know what's driving that. There was so much animosity between Jews and Samaritans. And, and Peter wants them to know all that animosity. I shouldn't be here. I shouldn't be touching you. I shouldn't be eating with you. I shouldn't be in the same room with you. And here, I'm going to lay my hands on you and trust that the same gifts that God gave me, he will give to you. Um, this is the closest I'm going to do to a rant today. Our world will not be changed by what we are against. Our world will not be changed by what we are against. Lots of voices. I'm against racism. Good for you. What are you for? Who are you for? Declaring what we are against only identifies to everyone else how we think about something, but it doesn't solve anything. The apostles didn't just say, we're against the prejudice of the, against the Samaritans. No, they come down and they lay hands on and they watch the Holy Spirit do the same thing in them that had been done in the apostles. So Peter goes in. Now, something was minis missing. They, they were believers. They were baptized, but they were not yet filled with the Spirit. There's, there's a lot I could go into on that, and if I had more time, I would develop that theme. But basically, one of the things that was true is that people were ministry consumers, but not ministry providers. You see, it's one thing, the instant you make a confession of faith, the Holy Spirit comes into your life. Like, that's a real thing. That moment. And he brings assurance of your relationship to God. So this isn't about... Does the Holy Spirit live within you or not? That, that's not the question. The Holy Spirit is within you. But it's one thing to have the assurance of your relationship. It's another, another thing to be empowered to operate out of that relationship. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. So when Simon saw this, and something was happening physically, something was happening visibly, that when this gift came on people, they knew that the Holy Spirit had been given. And so Simon wanted to buy the gifts. And here's the thing about gifts. You can't buy a gift. You can receive a gift. You can refuse a gift. But you can't buy a gift. What is he doing? He's operating with this concept the way he operated his whole life with sorcery. There's a price I can pay to get that. So I can do this. And uh, Peter's response is, 
You are full of bitterness and a captive of sin. Bitterness is quite a complicated and multi-layered emotion. It includes things like um, frustration, disappointment, fear. And a lot of people look at this and they say, well, you know, Simon kind of lost some of his status and maybe some income, and so he's just frustrated by that. I think it's a lot deeper than that. I don't think Peter is saying, you're just mad because we took your spot in the community. I think Peter put his finger on the thing that drove Simon to sorcery to begin with. You were bitter, and you were trapped, and you looked for a way to make a name for yourself and to get what you want, and you found it. Simon saw God as a force to be manipulated rather than as a father to love. So... We will not be a transforming influence without having a transforming experience. The greatest argument we will ever have is change lives, free lives, whole lives, restored lives. That's our greatest argument. And until you understand the heart of God, you will keep attempting you will keep attempting to earn the gift of God. When we do that, we treat the Holy Spirit like magic. It's a gift. The way you get ministry right is to get your heart right. Ministry is not about controlling others or getting, calling attention to yourself. Ministry is about connecting people with Jesus and watching his will be established in their lives. That's what it's about. So repentance, repentance is an ongoing response, not a one-time experience. And I just want to, I'm going to talk more about repentance next week, so I won't spend much time with it now. But there was a way that Simon saw the world. There was a way that Simon saw God. There was a way that Simon responded to what he perceived. And none of that changed, even though he believed and was baptized. See, a lot of people think that repentance is all about remorse and regret. How bad do you feel? And often, remorse and regret will accompany repentance, but it's not the same thing. Your shame and your guilt will not set you free from the patterns that control you. In fact, if anything, it will cause you to go deeper into them. Shame and guilt are unbelievably horrible at driving the worst human behavior possible. I, see, I wish I had time to develop this because I'm already over time, but, but as soon as you think you are worth less, then it is amazing what you will allow yourself to do. Well, I might as well. And there you go. And Simon didn't see God as a loving father. He didn't see Jesus for who he was, someone who would endure pain not avoid pain. And not just for pain purpose, but because there was something worthwhile that would work redemptively in someone else's life. The Holy Spirit can help us learn to see differently so we can respond differently. That's what repentance is. Let's bow our heads this morning. Um, I probably got under something in you today. And, and you may be sitting there thinking, I don't know if I believe that. And that's fine. I want you to wrestle with that thought. I'm not asking you to take what I say as being unchallengeable. I want you to think about it. But not just in a way, I want to find arguments that disagree with it. I want you to think about it in a way, does that help explain some of the things that are going on in my life? Because if you treat God and the Holy Spirit like magic, 
He will never be manipulated by you. And you will wind up feeling as though he has forsaken you. But the minute you see him for who he is, it changes how you respond. And that's part of repentance. Everybody thinks, well, just change your behavior. You can change your behavior and never repent. You see differently, so you respond differently. So, Father, help us today. Open our eyes to see you for who you are. Help us see our world for as it actually is, even if that sometimes frustrates or makes us fearful. Because you are with us. You're not just a trick that we use to make life more bearable. You are our Father and you are with us. You've created us for more than we have seen. And you are at work bringing that to pass. In Jesus' name, amen.